Praise the Lord. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to class. Uh, we'll begin. Can I ask um, Esther Sedisha to lead us in prayer, please? Esther Sisha, can you read us in prayer, please? Esther, are you there? Hello, Esther, are you there? Esther Sisha? Okay, uh, can anyone else lead us in prayer, please? Online students, anyone? Divya, Divya Darshini, can you lead us in prayer, please? I'll just lead, ma'am. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this uh, hour of study. We just pray, Father, that uh, as you minister to us through your word, we'll be able to retain whatever we're learning and apply the same in our lives, Father. We also pray, Father, for a blessing upon our entire faculty and all the students here in the college. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sanjay. Okay. Um... On um, Tuesday, we began studying Chapter 5, um, Understanding the Incarnation, okay? And we looked at how the in the Incarnation, the Eternal Word became flesh, right? It was God taking on human form. Okay, so God becoming man, God becoming a human being. And it's, it was important to note, or it's important to note that this was not merely God inhabiting a human form, okay? We know in mythology, uh, you know, that uh, even demons can possess human form, okay? So it is, when we're talking about incarnation, it is important to note that it's not merely God inhabiting a human body, but it's rather God becoming fully man, okay? The, he took on the fullness of humanity, which means in every aspect he was fully human, in every aspect, in his, in his intellect, in his emotions, in his uh, feelings, in his body, in his, um, uh, in his uh, interaction with others, in every sense, the fullest sense, he was human in every aspect okay and it is through in incarnation that you know uh, god dwelt with humanity in the past did god dwell with man in the past did god dwell with man yes no yes sister yes thank you sister getrude in the old testament God dwelt with man, his presence would come on the, in the tabernacle, right? Okay. Um, and we also see uh, that his presence went with them, even as they journeyed in the wilderness, okay, to the, to the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. So his presence was with them, but they were not able to experience God in a very real, tangible way, just like I would experience another human being. Just like I would experience all of you sitting here, I can see all of you, I can interact with you, I can talk with you, I can, you can talk back with me, you can see me, I can see you. You know, uh, uh, if, uh, uh, if I'm angry with you, it can show in my facial, uh, in my face, in my body language, in my, in my tone of voice. But in the Old Testament, they would only know if God was angry when this, you know, listening to his voice, okay, or the words that he he said what he spoke but when uh, when god became man he took on the fullness of humanity you know uh, he dwelt among humanity we learned this okay last week he dwelt in human with humanity in john chapter 1 verse 14 we read that and uh, which means he lived he moved he interacted uh, with us and why did he live move and interact with us Why did Jesus become human in the fullest sense, in every sense? Yeah. 
Why did Jesus become human in the fullest sense in every way? Why did he have to this live? Was because, uh, this is this was the requirement for the salvation of mankind. Uh, he had to sacrifice himself as a human, not as God. Okay. Why did Jesus come and live and move amongst us? He could have just come and, uh, you know, been born and he could have gone and died on the cross and gone back. Okay, to identify with us, thank you. To identify with us, to be an example to mankind, thank you, Deepu. Lucy says to manifest the Father God, to manifest the heart of the Father, to manifest the nature and the attributes of God. Hello, I was repeating this again and again in my last class. I hardly said a few lines and this is the same lines I was repeating and you all don't seem to remember. Okay, why did... God become man. Why did God become man? Please write down your the notes I'm saying. These are very basic things. Please read through your notes and please come back. It's very sad. Why did God become man? So that we can know God, we can understand God, okay? So that God himself can reveal who God is, his nature and attributes. What else? Like Deepu says, to be an example to mankind and also to pay for the penalty for our sins. Okay. So this is why God took on human form. He dwelt amongst us. He lived, moved and interacted with us to reveal, to reveal what? The nature, the attributes and the heart of the father to reveal the nature and the attributes of god himself so that we can know we can understand god we can relate to him in a more personal uh, way that is why he created us to fellowship with him to have a relationship with uh, him okay so uh, that is why we see jesus says in john chapter 14 verse 9 anyone who has seen me has seen the father because the Father and I are one, okay? Which means that Jesus perfectly reveals the Father to us because he is the Son of God. He is the only begotten Son of God, okay? We also looked at, you know, Jesus not only came to uh, reveal the nature and attributes of God, but he also came to speak what the father wants to speak to us what the father wants to communicate to us and so we looked at hebrews chapter 1 verse uh, verses 1 to 3 right but in hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 to 3 we also saw that jesus is the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person okay so when jesus was uh, when jesus walked on this earth what glory did he manifest the sonship glory. Okay, why did he manifest the sonship glory? Why didn't he manifest the glory of God, even though he was fully God and fully man, 100% God, 100% man? Why didn't he manifest the glory of God? Why did he manifest the sonship glory? Glory of God, we can't experience it, ma'am. Sonship glory, we can feel him, we can experience his love and care. And we'll be able to see him. Okay. Thank you. There is one student who listens to my lecture in the online is Lucy. And thank you, Lucy. You encourage me so much. Yes, uh, Nelson. Uh, because no one has seen God ever. And if we try to see him, we, though we can't see him. So. so if he manifested himself in the glory of the of deity of glory of God, we cannot experience him in a very tangible, in a very real way. Thank you, Nelson, also for listening. Okay, so we see that Jesus manifested his sonship glory during his earthly ministry, and which means that he refrained from manifesting his the, the divine glory, the glory of God. Not that he did not possess it, not that he emptied himself, not that he gave it up, but he refrained. What is the meaning of refrained? What's the meaning of refrained? To hold back. 
yeah, to, to hold back, to cease, to abstain, to leave off, okay? So he refrained from manifesting the divine glory. And why did he do so? Why did he do this? So that we can, in a tangible way, experience the nature and attributes of God, okay? Through his human form. Because we are human, we can experience him in a human way. So by becoming flesh, the eternal God or the eternal word, submitted himself to certain limitations for us. Okay? He limited himself. Not that he was not fully God, but he refrained from using, or he uh, limited himself from using or manifesting. We'll look at what are the things he refrained from using or manifesting, Okay, so that we can easily understand and we can completely understand and know God, okay, and also when he refrained from using, you know, his nature of deity or his glory, uh, his authority to be honored and worshipped, he could then only reveal himself to us so that we could understand him in that sense. So he could only reveal what could be revealed in the limitations of humanness or he could only reveal himself okay in the what uh, he could only reveal what could be revealed in the limitations of humanness and you know so that we can understand we can perceive him we can comprehend him with our limited minds and with our uh, physical eyes okay so what we need to understand is that on the earth jesus was true God and true man. He was fully God. He was fully man. He was 100% God. He was 100% man. And he did not become flesh in the sense of ceasing to be what he eternally was. That means he eternally was what? Who was he eternally? Who was he eternally? He's God eternally, okay? So when he became man, it does not become, does not mean that he ceased from becoming God. Okay. Rather, it is the eternal God who took on the fullness of humanity, took on the fullness of body, soul, and spirit, but he limited himself to the manifestations of his divinity. Please, this is very, very important for you to understand. When Jesus was on the earth, he was fully God. He was fully man. It was not that when he became man, he stopped being God. It was not that he um, you know, he was not God in any sense. He was fully God. He was fully man. But he, you know, um, uh, limited himself or he refrained, stopped from, you know, put off from using some of his uh, nature or attributes of deity so that we can understand him, we can experience him. All of you understood? Yes, online students? Are you all with me? Yes? Able to understand? Very well. This is very, very important. Okay? So, if some people say that when Jesus became God, a man, he was not God. Okay? If he was God, we can't, you know, we can't relate to him. We can't crucify him. But he was fully God. He was fully man. But he limited himself or refrained himself from using the nature and the attributes of God. And we'll see what are those in a bit. Okay? So we were looking at John chapter 1, verse, is, um, verse 14. We, uh, we read one, verses 1 to 3, but basically we were looking at verse 14 where it says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Okay, I, I spoke about what is flesh, what is dwelt. We beheld his glory. I spoke about the glory, the glory of the one and uh, the glory of the uh, only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Okay. So what is the, uh, there was a question before we ended class last week, say, what is the meaning of begotten? The Greek word for begotten is monogenes, okay? It means one and only, okay? Or one and only son, or one and only, or one single of its kind, which means there is only one of a kind, okay? So from the Greek translation, we can understand that Jesus is not just a son, but he's the one and only son of the Father. Okay, He's one of a kind, single of its kind, which, uh, which means he's only one of a kind and no one can compare to 
Jesus. He's a unique son of God who is uniquely, in the sense his unique son means he is fully God and fully man. Are you all sons of God? Yes, but you all are not in the sense of unique, in the sense that you are not fully God and fully man, but only Jesus was the begotten son, which means only one of a kind where he is the only unique, uh, only one and only son of God the Father, unique in the sense there's no one else like Jesus. Okay, So that is what uh, we studied in the last class. We will... Um, yeah, Sanjay says we are adopted sons and daughters of God. But when I didn't say adopted, because when we look when we when we look at the word adopted, we think about it in the earthly sense, okay, um, uh, where we we are not um, you know fully like the parents, okay. But when 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 God made us His children, uh, we are His we are His uh, we have His nature, right? Uh, when we are dead to sin, when we are born again, we are dead to sin. That's why uh, Paul in Romans chapter 6 says that we identify, spiritually identify with Christ. We spiritually identify with his death, his, uh, his crucifixion, his death, his burial, his resurrection and his ascension. So how do we identify spiritually with his burial? Is when he died, we also are dead and no longer we have the sinful nature but we have the divine nature operating in us but when we say adopted we are not the same nature as our as our parents uh, we are you know the same nature as the one who has given us birth not the one who has adopted us and so that's why we didn't i didn't use the word adopted okay i just feel that uh, i'm not an adopted daughter of god i'm just his daughter it makes me feel more <laughs> privilege in that sense okay anyways sister, sister once again sister adoption once again adoption yes, uh, uh the, yes the bible says that we are adopted uh the, the spirit of adoption you know uh, the holy spirit reminds us that we are sons and daughters but i would not prefer to use the word adopted because uh, when we say adopt adopted the person who's adopting us it does not become our real parents we don't have their nature we don't have their genes we don't have their blood running through us okay i have the one who's given me birth who's not my mother now my parents now but when we talk about um, god or, uh, we are sons and daughters of god you know we have that we partake in a divine nature of god okay so in that sense, we are not really adopted. So I would not like to use the word adopted. Anyway, Sanjay, thank you for saying that. Yes. So we'll move on. Um, we look at the seven steps in the incarnation. Okay. And so we'll understand uh, in a more detailed way uh, what are the uh, what did God do for us, and um, you know, um, um, and how you know what are the things He refrained from using. Uh, when he became, when he took on the form of a human being. Okay, uh, before I move on to that, I was just reminded, you know, uh, uh, this uh, this movie, um, which is based on a true life story of a of a pianist, a man who you know who plays the piano, very gifted. He's a Jew, and during the World War II. You know, the Jews were severely persecuted and he lived in Warsaw, Poland. Warsaw, Poland was one of the main places where Jews were greatly affected in Warsaw, Poland because the Nazis, the Germans took over it. And so here is Spielsman, who is a, a pianist. And, um, and it's amazing how God uh, protected him and he lasted through the Second World War. Know, just in hiding in these uh, broken ruined homes and and all of that even though he was so many times caught and you know to be sent away into the the sun um, uh, 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 Jewish ghettos but somehow God just saved him so um, and he won the, the person who acted in this movie as Spielsman uh, in the movie pianist he he got the the award for the best um, uh, actor but it's, they say that this man, to get into this role of being spielsman, just to understand the whole role, he actually gave away all his belongings. Okay, he gave away his house, every riches, everything, even to the extent that he even, you know, um, split up with his girlfriend. 
okay he broke his relationship with his girlfriend just to come to a place where he wanted to understand what it feels to be a person who loses everything to lose relationships family home you know uh, uh, comforts and just to live so that he can get into that role of that uh, of that person as even as he's acting it out in the movie so you know when i was just going through this lesson i was reminded of that you know when an actor can do so much just to get into a role you know how much more uh, the son of god how much more has god done for you and me it just just shows uh, it, this man's um, love for acting shows in the way he gave up everything just to get into the role but you know god doing all this for me just refraining from using his nature and attributes just to identify with us just to show the love of god to us just to reveal the father heart of god to us you know um, just shows god's love just shows god's grace just shows god's mercy i just wanted to uh, to say that okay okay we'll move on to uh, looking at philippians chapter 2 verse verse 6 to 8 a very powerful uh, pa passage in scripture where we'll understand uh, more about the incarnation and what god uh, refrained from using or refrained from being even as he took on humanity okay so can somebody please read uh, philippians chapter 2 verses 6 to 8 please can I read, sister? Yes. Yeah, Philippians 2, six, verses 6 to 8. Who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a born servant and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Amen. Thank you, Sister Gertrude. So a few things that we can uh, study here or examine here is the first one is who being in the form of God. Okay. So Christ was in the form of God. But even though he was in the form of God, he did not consider to it to be equal with God, okay? Or he did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. And he also made himself of no reputation. He took on the form of a bond servant, and he came in the likeness of man, and also he was found in the appearance of man, okay? So we'll look and study each of these phrases, very important. So everyone, wakey, wakey, don't go to sleep, okay? Please uh, listen carefully. Christ was in the form of God. Now, if you look at this in the literal Greek, the literal Greek, if you read it in the literal Greek, it says, who subsisting. Subsisting means who living or existing, subsisting is S-U-B-S-I-S-T-I-N-G. So subsisting means living or existing. So in the Greek Bible, it says, who subsisting in the form of God. Okay. Now the word form <clears throat> is the same word that is also used. You know, he took on the form of a born servant in the same uh, verses that we read. Okay, in verse 6, it says, who being in the form of God, verse 7 says, taking the form of the bond servant. Okay, now it's the same word used form there, but it we need to distinguish it. Okay, we need to, um, uh, we need to uh, see it separately. We need to, it has to be seen separately from, you know, form does not mean what is human form. When we say human form, what do we mean? What do we mean when we say human form? Form of a dog, form of a fish, form of a human being, what do we mean by form? The way we look, our appearance, okay? So, you know, when we, we know what, we, when we look at a fish, we know it's a fish because it has the form of a fish. When you look at a dog, we look at, we know it's a dog because it just has a form of a uh, dog. Yes, a shape, okay? Or uh, the way we look. So 
when we hear form does not mean just mere likeness or appearance okay um so it means it's uh, you know the word form is used not to denote something that is just outward or external so we we cannot say hey when we say that god took the form of man we can say god came in a spirit and he possessed a human being or he just took the form of a man but he was fully god inside no here we're not just talking about outward appearance we're not just talking about external way that we look it refers to basically the being or the attributes or the character or the nature the essential nature so when we're saying that uh, that jesus uh, was in the you know who in the form of god means we're saying that who is in the nature of god he had the essential nature that was of god he had the attributes of god okay and the nature and the attributes of god is seen outward so what is your nature your inward nature can be seen outward what is your nature can be seen in the way you act in the way you speak in your words in your actions in your reactions okay so here when it says christ was in the form of god it means basically that you know he was not just had a form like an outward appearance but in his very being in his very nature in his very attributes you know he was god so christ existed as god and he possessed all the nature of god even though he became man he existed or he had all the nature or the being of god now when we use the word form we basically think of shape like andrew here mentioned our shape okay we think of the shape of something but in the ancient greek uh, word you know it has none of this idea none of this idea of shape it's it's more the idea of an mode or an essence who you really are your being your personality your nature your attributes so it is the essential nature of god without implying without meaning shape or just an image okay it's who you are your being your nature now the greek word for form is morphe okay and um, another greek word for form in greek is schema okay s c h e m a but if you look at uh, you know um, Paul writing this he does not use the greek word schema schema means the outward form which changes from time to time which changes from circumstances to circumstances so we can say sometimes you know uh, god became man sometimes he could become a fish sometimes he could become a dog we're not talking about schema where we're saying it's just an outward form which changes from time to time and from circumstances to circumstance but it's basically morphe morphe means a form which never alters which never changes just the same okay throughout so that is the greek word that is used here for form so jesus who was in the form of god which means he had the nature the attributes the character he was a very being of god you all understood that yes okay now the word being is from the ancient greek word uh, which describes that which a man is in his very essence and which cannot be changed just like i said morphe is something that cannot be changed the same way being who being in the form of god which means it describes a man in his very essence okay which cannot be changed it describes that part of a man which in any circumstances remains the same you can't say hey sometimes i feel like uh, an angel so i'm going to fly and you know you can't keep changing you're just a human being the form does not change okay uh, so it's that being which describes a man in his very essence which cannot be changed so here we see that you know um, the first thing who being in the form of god so even when jesus became man he was still had the nature the attributes the being of god in him 
it did not change. He was just the same. He had the same being, the nature, and the attributes of God. Okay? And the next one, uh, next phrase we will see, okay, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Okay? So, now this has been explained before. We explained in chapter 2 what it means when we said that Jesus was equal with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. So I'm not going to explain it again. Okay. We look at the third phrase. Okay. He did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Okay. He did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Now, if you look at the literal Greek translation of this verse, because the New, New Testament is written in Greek, it says he did not deem being on equality with God, something to grasp or to hold on to, okay? So it did not deem means what? Did not, he did not regard, he did not consider, he did not suppose, he did not think to be equal with God is something to, to grasp or to hold on. So when Jesus, who was God, took on human form, you know, uh, even though he was fully God, he was fully man, he did not want to hold on to his uh, nature of deity. He was willing to refrain from using it. Okay, So it says he did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. That means he did not regard it, he did not suppose or think to be equal with God. You know, something that he had to hold on to, something that he had to grasp on to. Okay, so the ancient Greek, uh, uh, you know, uh, the ancient Greek translation for this phrase has the idea of something being grasped onto or cling to, which means when Jesus became human, even though he was fully God, he did not cling on to the privileges of deity. Okay, he was willing to refrain from using it, which shows that he was not insecure, you know, from. He's not thinking, hey, what if I give up my glory of deity? What if I give up my glory of my, uh, uh, my nature, my attributes of God? Uh, what, you know, if God the Father does not give it back to me? See, you know, for, for some of us, titles are so important, right? You know, if somebody doesn't call you pastor so-and-so, apostle so-and-so, uh, professor so-and-so, you know, doesn't give you that uh, miss or missus or, you know, if you are... Um, you know, um, like for uh, some of our mainline churches, for bishops, they say, right, reverend, bishop, so-and-so. They have to use all of these names. And if they forget, the pastor will be reprimanded, OK? So some of us hold on to these titles. So hey, why didn't that person call me pastor? Why did they call me by my name? You know, we get so angry. We can, And sometimes we don't want to lose our titles. When we lose our job, when we lose our titles, we become so insecure. But look at this, you know, when 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 God became man, even though he was fully God, he was fully man, he refrained from being equal with God. He refrained from, you know, um, uh, uh, be, uh, 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 you know, he refrained from using his nature of being omnipotent, omniscient, Oh, and um, oh, omnipotent, okay, and being worshipped and honoured as God. He refrained from using his uh, glory of deity. And he did not feel that he had to cling on to it. He had to hold on to it. What if I'm going to lose it? What if I, uh, you know, the Father takes away all of these privileges from me? But we see Jesus was so secure in his calling, secure in what he had to do. And why do you think he was willing to give up or refrain from using all of these things? Why do you think he was willing to refrain from giving up his, uh, refrain from using his uh, glory as deity, refrain from, you know, using his nature of being omnipotent, omniscient, omnipotent? Why do you think? Any answers? Why didn't he feel that he had to cling on to it and grasp on to it? Hello, no answers. Because, sister, he wanted to be as a fully human being. Fully he was fully human, being. human. He was fully human in this entire sense, yes. To be identified uh, with us in our pain and our struggles and challenges, sister. 
okay to identify with us okay obedience yes obedience to whom obedience to the father yes jesus always says i've come to do the will of my father and sanjay says humility yes the humility another thing was jesus was his security was not in his nature in his attributes in just his glory as deity he was secure in his relationship with the father and with the holy spirit that is more important he was so secure in his relationship he was so sure of the love the father has for him that's why he says you know the father loves me even as i love the father i've come to do the will of my father so like nelson says it was complete obedience to the will of the father and it was also his security was in his relationship with the father this is something that is very important for us to learn uh, uh, hear and receive and learn from jesus himself okay so we see that jesus even though he was fully god he refrained from using his nature and attributes okay he was willing to lay it aside for some time refrain from using it he was not insecure so it's important for us not to put our security in titles in positions in our wealth in uh, in all that we have but our security should be in what what should be our security we should be secure in what in our relationship with god our relationship with god is what is more important okay out of that relationship comes honor good name because honor good name the bible says comes from who from god okay so don't hold on to your titles don't hold on to your privileges don't hold on to your positions it's important that like jesus you're secure in your relationship with god you're secure in your obedience to god you're secure in doing the will of the father the saying god even if people don't call me as pastor even if people don't um, give me the honor respect of a pastor of an apostle of a teacher of a whoever you are a missionary whatever i'm here to do your will irrespective of that i'm here god to do your will you call me in this place to do your will i want to be obedient and i want to be humble okay sanjay says his disciples were able to give their life for their gospel because they too were secure in their identity in christ very true right the early apostles the early church why do we see so much of glory manifested in them because there was unity and oneness you know mm. and also they sold everything and everything ha everyone had everything in common okay and they were not behind power and position look at apostle paul himself very learned man who knew the old testament studied under great teachers extremely learned man received great revelations from god himself imagine god the holy spirit himself taught during that silent years of those three and a half years when he was in the in arabia you know but look at the 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 lifestyle of paul okay very simple very very uh, you know doing the will of uh, uh, god being obedient to the call of god and that is what god wants us to do so something that we learn from god he did not consider it robbery to be equal with uh, god so the ancient greek word for robbery means you know a treasure that you hold on to treasure means you know what what is treasure something very very precious something that is very valuable it's a treasure that you want to hold on to doesn't you don't want to let go okay you will not let go of it at any risk any any point even if you face danger you face risk you face threats even for your life you're not willing to let go of that treasure you'll hold that treasure even if somebody shooting you okay it's that close so here it means that even though jesus was equal with co equal with god the father he had the right to be honored and worshiped at god but he did not hold on to his glorious estate and heavenly privileges he was willing to lay it aside he was willing to refrain from using it 
you know, just because he wanted to do the will of the Father, just because he wanted us to experience the heart of the Father. Isn't that wonderful? Okay, so, you know, sometimes when people don't give you honor and respect, you know, when you when you go for a meeting and, uh, you know, you, are, you come in, nobody looks at you, nobody welcomes you, nobody says, please sit here, nobody takes you to the dais, you know, nobody welcomes you, acknowledges you, what do you do? You get very, very angry, you get very, very upset. Even some of you become a pastors in your church, you know, people don't respect you, you, you feel very insecure, you feel very angry with those people, you know. But here we see that even though Jesus was equal with God, he had the right to be honored and worshipped as God. He did not hold on to his glorious estate and heavenly privilege. He was willing to refrain from using it, lay it aside, so that, you know, he can do the will of the Father. He can be obedient to the Father. Okay. The next phrase, he made himself of no reputation. All of you with me, you are able to understand? Yes. He, he made himself of no reputation. Now, if you look at this verse in the Greek, it says, but emptied himself. In some translations, it says, Christ emptied himself. Now, when people read this, they say, hey, look at this verse. It says, Christ emptied himself. That means they're saying that when God, when Jesus became man, he emptied himself of everything of God and he yeah. became fully man. man. But this word emptied does not, in the Greek, does not mean, empty means kali or, you know, having nothing, you know, or emptied. Okay. Descend from one's rank of dignity. Uh, emptied means, uh, you know, it indicates condescendence. Condescendence means, you know, coming down in rank, coming down in rank, okay? Uh, means you voluntarily coming descending down okay in one's rank or one's dignity so willingly you know voluntarily willingly you're willing to come down from a high position okay from a high position suppose you are uh, you know sometimes uh, you know pastors can also come to the to the church and then they see the church they, uh, dirty they can take the broom and sweep so coming down from the role of a pastor to being a yeah, a maid, just cleaning and a, a volunteer, just doing the volunteer's uh, job. So we, when we say that when Jesus emptied himself, it does not mean that he emptied himself of being deity. It does not mean he emptied himself of being God. Emptied himself of having the attributes and nature of the very being or the essence of God. It just means that he, you know, um, uh, you know, he, and it also means that he did not lay aside his essential nature as deity, but it means rather he willingly refrained from expressing or exercising his divine attributes. That means he willingly refrained from using his attributes of being omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. Mm -hmm. And we look at it when we study about his human humanity, we we'll study how he was not omnipotent, how he was not omniscient and how he was not omnipresent, uh, okay? So he laid aside his position of equality with God the Father to be honored and worshipped, to be esteemed, and also he refrained in the exercise or the expression of his divine attributes, divine nature of being omnipotent, omniscient, and omni present okay and that is why we say when he was on the earth he manifested his sonship glory and that is why he tells uh, the father in john chapter 17 verse 5 father glorify me together with yourself with the glory which i had you know before uh, with you before the world was okay so even he refrained from manifesting the deity of uh, the glory of the deity or the glory of um, god so he says, now, Father, I've completed my work. Now you can, you know, give me back the glory that I um, had. So when Jesus was walking on this earth, he manifested his sonship glory. Okay. So this was his position of equality with God at the right, and that he was at the right hand of God. He was equal with God. But even then, he did not consider it to be equal with God, you know, or something that he had to hold on to 
grasp onto, but he willingly laid it aside in the incarnation, willingly refrained from using this, okay? Which means that, it, it does not mean that Jesus was not fully God when he walked on the earth. Yes, he was fully God, fully man, okay? But he made this choice for you and me to just refrain from using his nature, of um, an attributes of deity of being omnipotent, omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. Also, refrain from using the glory of deity, and um, also being, you know, honored, worshipped, and being esteemed. And he submitted himself to the Father. So we see that in his incarnation, Jesus was teaching us humility, was teaching us submission, he was teaching us yieldedness, he was teaching us how to uh, do the will of the Father, which was more important than all of these things that we hold on to, okay, which is so important for us as believers, as people of God. Sometimes we're willing to let go of God, we're willing to let go of our faith and putting our trust in Jesus, but we want to hold on to our titles, our positions, our, uh, you know, the, the, the respect that we get uh, and all of those things. Remember when we studied about um, uh, Brinham, you know, Brinham, when you studied about, uh, what was those, uh, your, uh, for your um, orientation, you were studying all of those uh, uh, God's generals. And I did uh, Brinham. Remember Brinham? He was mightily used by God in the supernatural. But he was not somebody who was a good speaker, a teacher, and a preacher. But God used him for in healing miracles, right? But what happened when the season or the time for healing miracles kind of dwindled down? You know? What happened when there was no more miracles were happening? Brinham suddenly thought, hey, I'm losing my position. I'm losing my identity. You know, people are going away. I'm not a preacher. I'm not a teacher. You know, he doesn't. He did not study in any theological college. He did not go to. He did not have proper schooling. He could not even read the Bible. But what happened for him to hold on to his position and his estate, and to his respect, and for people to continue coming to him to his meetings? He started preaching and teaching and it ended up in teaching and preaching all the wrong doctrines we let so many people uh, straight okay but Brinham was not willing to let go and say okay God you used me for a season thank you you did great miracles for me what is next for me but instead of asking God what is next for me he was so possessive of his title position that he was losing his recognition in front of people that he started preaching and teaching and he he you know he um, led people astray with all false doctrines and teachings. So it's important for us, you know, to do the will of God, irrespective of whether we get the titles, position, honor, and the respect. Okay. Uh, we just have one more minute. We'll stop here. Any questions? We look at um, the rest of the phrases in the next class. Any questions anyone has? No, this today is a, a very important lesson we learned. Satan can subtly, you know, get us so gripped on, held on to titles, our position, our respect, that we're willing to let go of God and our calling, but not our positions and our titles. Okay, but Jesus was willing to refrain from using all of those so that he could do the will of the Father so he can submit to the Father, right? Any questions, any doubts, anything anyone wants to say? Okay, if not, uh, since we finished uh, four lessons, we'll have our first um, assessment. I'll uh, post the dates in the stream page. All of you, please take a look at it. And then, you know, if you give your confirmation, we'll go ahead with the first assessment, okay? If there are no questions. We'll end class. Thank you all for joining class. Please read uh, what was taught today, ponder. Uh, make it, uh, uh, you know, practical in your own lives. Um, and I'll see you on um, Tuesday. Thank you, everyone.